This is the first part of a multi-part series on developing and using classes. I originally planned this as a three-part series, but while developing the content, new ideas kept forming while others went nowhere. So at this stage, all I can say is there will be multiple parts. How many parts will be determined mostly by keeping the videos short and any new ideas that come up and of course any comments or questions and suggestions that I get. In this initial part, I'm concentrating on developing a class in MQL4. I create a lot of content for both MT4 and MT5, and I'm currently in the middle of an exercise to make as much of that code common between the two platforms as possible. With that in mind, I'll often be referring to techniques and styles that are included in the libraries that are delivered by default with MT5, although I won't just be duplicating those, but I will be working to maintain compatibility with them. Now that doesn't mean that I'll just be adding a library that makes MT5 look like MT4. In future parts in this series, I'll be extending these MQL4 classes to work in MQL5. For now, this is a fully working class, although there are a number of sections of this code that will be replaced and rewritten in the future. Since I'm writing a class, I want that class to be reusable, and that means putting it into an MQH file in the include folder. But MT4 and MT5 both come with a number of default or example files, and I don't want to get mixed with those. So what I'm going to do first is just create my own folder where I can store my own classes. Just quickly before I create the class, why am I creating a class for this indicator? So firstly, this is a coding demonstration and creating an indicator in a class is as good a place as any to start. But secondly, I'm trying to maintain consistency between my MT4 and MT5 code. If you've tried coding in MT5, you will have noticed that functions like moving average in MT4 returned a value, where in MT5 they used to create an internal object which keeps the values up to date and you retrieve them as needed. Creating a class is very close to that model for MT5, so it will help me to maintain a single code base that I can use between MT4 and MT5. Let's start by creating the class using the wizard. I'm doing this because it's good for demonstration, but in reality I usually have my own modified standard class template and I typically just start by copying that template rather than use the wizard. For now, the wizard will do everything we need. For this demonstration, I'm going to create a Donchian channel. The demonstration is about the class development and not the indicator, and a Donchian channel is a very simple indicator to write. If you're not familiar with Donchian channels, they're formed by the highest high and the lowest low of the past n periods. I referred to Donchian channels in a recent video about a two-channel trading strategy. Start the wizard either from the File menu by selecting New File or by right-clicking on the folder and selecting New File. They both bring up the same dialog. In the dialog, the wizard's identified that we're using the Include folder, and so it's selected a new Include file by default. But I want to create a class, so select the New Class option and then click Next. You can see the Include file name already has the path where we began, and I need to fill in my class name. If I begin a class, you can see that the wizard removes the opening C. An uppercase opening C is a typical method for denoting a class name, and the wizard knows enough to remove that from the file name. It can only do that, however, if the second letter is uppercase. If I do this again, you can see that it now has included the C. I want to call my class C C I Donchian channel. And I've included the CI again so that I can differentiate this from any files that MetaTrader may release in the future. Uh, because I've used the lowercase CI, the wizard hasn't removed the C, so I'm going to remove that from my file name. So the file will be Donchian channel, and the class will be the CCI Donchian channel. I have no base class for this demonstration. Uh, fill in the author and the link information, and then click Finish. The wizard has produced a complete class. I could compile this class and even include it in other code, although at this stage the class itself does nothing. I'm just going to make a few formatting changes that won't affect the structure at all, and then we'll carry on. The Donchian channel only needs three inputs, symbol, time frame, and number of bars. The first thing to do is to create three class variables to store that information. So here I've created them. I'm using a convention of preceding my member class variables with a lowercase m. 
So I have the symbol, the time frame, which I've specified using enum time frames rather than an integer, and the bar count being the number of bars that I'm going to include to calculate the Donchian channel. The wizard's already created a default constructor, taking no arguments, and a default destructor or deconstructor, depending how you want to name it. And the class itself, the definition of the class itself, ends with bracket semicolon. And then the wizard has placed the function bodies for the constructor and the destructor here with no code so far. These are special cases of functions. They are void functions, but there is no requirement to add the void keyword at the beginning of the function definitions for the constructor and destructor. I'm going to create an init function that can be called by the constructor. My preference is not to have any coding logic in the constructors themselves. I use the constructor instead to call the init function. So for the init function, I'm going to take all three of the arguments required for the Donchian channel. I'm adding the init function to the public section of the class. That means the function can be called also directly by programs using the class, as well as by any functions inside this class. The definition just lists the arguments to the function and ends with a semicolon. The actual function is written later in the code. Inside the init function, I'll just assign the inputs to the three class member variables I created earlier, symbol, time frame, and bar count. The init function takes three arguments, but the default constructor has none. So I'm going to do two things. First, in the default constructor, I'm going to call the init function using the current chart symbol, period, and the default value for the number of bars. Then, to use a constructor with other arguments, I'm going to create a new constructor that accepts all three arguments. And then in the body of that constructor, I'll simply call the init function passing through the symbol, time frame, and bar count that are received as part of the constructor. Donchian channels calculate a high and a low value. I need a place to put those inside my class. First, I'm going to create two arrays as member variables to store the high and low values for the channel. And next I'll modify the init function to set those arrays as a series so that they match the sequence that you find bars on charts. To fill the high and low channel values and keep them up to date, I need an update function. First the function definition. And for now, I'm making this private. That means that the function is only available to be called from other functions inside this class. Now the function body. The update function is performing almost the same task as the onCalculate event from an indicator. So I've copied in the onCalculate header here for reference. If you look at the arguments to onCalculate, rates total is just the total number of bars available for calculation. Time, open, high, low, and the remainder here are all available through the iTime, iOpen, etc. functions. The only argument passed in that isn't readily available for another function is prev calculated, which tells me how many bars I've calculated previously in going through this function. To handle prev calculated, just create another member variable. Then in the init function, I'll set prev calculated to zero. And now prev calculated is available for me to use in the update function. Now that I have prev calculated, the body of the update function is simple. Firstly, it's a void function, as I defined earlier. Functions inside classes begin with the class name followed by two colons. This differentiates that function name from a function that might be in a standard include file. Now the first thing I do is calculate number of bars available. And I do that by simply calling the iBars function using the symbol and time frame that we set up as member variables of the class. To avoid recalculating everything every time this function is called, I add in the same code to calculate number of bars that I would use in a standard indicator. So here I'm saying limit, which is the number of bars that I'm going to calculate this time, is equal to the total number of bars available minus the number of bars that we've previously calculated. And then to make sure that I always recalculate the current open bar, I simply say that if prev calculated is greater than zero, I'll add one to my limit.
that forces bar number zero to always be recalculated. And while I should never need it, I've just added a condition here that if limit is less than or equal to zero, so if it's telling me that I have nothing to calculate, then I'm just going to return early. In a standard indicator, the buffers are automatically sized based on the number of bars available. But for the class, I need to do that manually. So all I'm doing here is comparing the number of bars that I have available, which I calculated above, with the size of the high channel, which should always be the same as the size of the low channel. And if they're different, I'm simply going to resize the high channel and the low channel to be equal to the number of bars that I have. Now the channel calculates the highest high and the lowest low for n bars. But for the first bars of the chart, we don't have n bars to do that calculation. So I'm adding a variable here to use in the calculation in case there aren't enough bars. In the calculation loop then, I'm calculating this limb variable based on the number of bars that I have available. And I'm setting that equal to my bar count specified if I have enough bars, and if not, I'm setting it to the number of bars that I have available. Finally, I'm going to assign the number of bars that I've been through in the calculation to mprev calculated, and this is equivalent to returning rates total in an indicator function. There is a situation that I have to handle where in MetaTrader bars can disappear from the chart. MetaTrader maintains a finite number of bars, and when there are too many bars, it will remove the earliest bars to make room for more. To handle this, I'm going to keep track of the earliest bar date, and if that changes, then I know that I need to recalculate the entire array. First, add a member variable to store the time of the first bar. In the init function then, set the value of that first bar to zero. In the update function, calculate the time of the current first bar on the chart. I'm just using the iTime function, bars minus one. Um, I've got number of bars already, which means that the very first bar is numbered bars minus one. Then, if the first bar time that I've just calculated, being the first bar on the chart, is not the same as the first bar time that I've stored in my member variable, all I'm doing is setting limit equal to the total number of bars, and then I'm updating my first bar time member variable with the current first bar from the chart. Of course, we need to be able to get the high and low values from the class. I'm going to create public functions to return the high or the low value, and they each take a single argument, which is the index. I create the body of the high function. Now you may have noticed that apart from the init function, the update is never called. I do that for efficiency. I don't know if we're going to need the values from this channel at any point. If I called the update constantly, I'd be wasting resources doing calculations that may never be needed. So I only call the update function when the value is accessed. So here I'm calling the update to begin when we access high. I'm testing that the index passed in is not greater than the number of elements available. If it is, then I'm returning a zero. And apart from that, all I have to do is return the indexed position from the high channel. And the body of the low function is the same for the low channel. To demonstrate using the class, I've put together a standard custom indicator. First thing I've done is to include the include file with the class definition. Uh, I have an input for my number of periods. Uh, it has the usual buffers that are required for an indicator. I've declared a variable of type CCI Donchian channel, and this is a pointer variable denoted by the asterisk. Uh, that means that I actually need to create the instance of this later. In my init function then, I'm setting the value of that Donchian channel variable to be a new CCI Donchian channel. I'm passing in the current chart symbol, the current chart period, which I'm casting into a time frame, because remember that we set the constructor to take a time frame rather than an integer. And the default period variable for a chart is an integer. And then I'm passing in periods, which I've taken in my input statement earlier. In the on calculate. I'm still calculating limits, mainly so that I know how many 
elements from the class to copy into the buffers that are displayed on screen. But then I have no calculations here. You can see all I'm doing is assigning into the high buffer on the chart the value from the Donchian channel class or the Donchian channel object, the high value for index i and the low value for index i. And that's all I need to do to write this indicator. I'll just compile that. And now if I go to the chart, and now it's drawn the Donchian channel using the class. And remember, in the indicator, because I've created this as a pointer variable, delete the object when we finish. This has only been an introduction to classes, and there's a lot more to be done with this class. In future videos in the series, I'll be converting this to MT5 versions, adding another indicator, incorporating inheritance, improving the functions and the structure of the class, improving the indicator where we use the class, and building an expert advisor using this class and other classes. To make sure you don't miss the future parts of this series, uh, remember to click the subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified when new videos appear. And thank you.